So, Lord, we thank you for your word. God, right now, I just ask that you would prepare us to um, not just understand or, or comprehend or know things, God, but experience your presence right now. As we look at your sovereignty, as we look at stepping into the book of Revelation and how overwhelming it can be, God, you even say that blessed is he who reads, hears, and heeds this prophecy, this word, God. And you know what? We want to listen to your word. We want to hear what you have for us, and we want to heed that so people can be blessed by your love and understanding of who you are. So, Jesus, we're here because we love you, and we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. All right. So, what we're going to look at here is three points. And so, um, as Waxer is, like you said, getting ready for uh, the, the homiletics class and things like that, um, I get the opportunity to, to kind of do um, uh, just a, an intro as we step into Revelation here in the coming weeks. And I wanted to look at really the nature and character of God. So to make it easy, more for me than you, just so I can track, three points. And uh, I was discipled by uh, and mentored by Danny Lehman. And so he taught me the beauty of acronyms, right? So it just makes it easy for us to remember stuff. And so the acronym we're going to use is God. So G-O-D, okay? And so God is good. Nice. He is omni, which means all, omnipresent, omnipowerful. Thank you, omniscient. <laughs> I forgot there for a moment. Okay. And um, it just hold on. Just, we got a good you know, half an hour of this going. And D, he is divine. He is God. We're not. Let's, let's deal with it. Okay. So why is this important? Why is it important to understand who God is? Well, uh, if you're like me, and I pray that you're not, but if you are, um, when you read through the book of Revelation, there's a lot going on. How many people have, and, and no shame here, okay, just, how many people have read through, like, you know, had the opportunity to read through the whole book of Revelation at some point in your life? I want, you know, say, okay. How many people have started it and just went, what? No, okay, I'm going back. <laughs> all right, don't, liars go to church, so it's okay. Raise, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> right? And so... I'm a very visual person, so you start reading about dragons and this horn, and you're just like, what is going on? I want the movie to come out. That's what I want. I want somebody <laughs> who's got a good budget to put this thing down. And I, I want, like, you know, like the movie 300. I want good stuff. You know, not that 300 is good, but the graphics. Cinematography I'm talking about. We're moving on. Okay. Um, <laughs> don't judge me. It says that Jesus is the only judge. So... It's good to have this perspective because we can get overwhelmed in the imagery. We can get overwhelmed in the details as we begin to say, okay, my God, is this all about last times? And we actually say, no, this is not what we're talking about. What are we talking about? We're talking about a picture of Jesus. We're talking that when we walk away from the book of Revelation, I hope that you have the same experience that I do and that I walk away with an amazing reverence and awe of who God is, of who Jesus is. And this book causes me to want to worship him in a deeper way, not out of fear, but out of reverence. And he puts me in a place of where, in the flesh I say, I'm glad I'm on the right team, okay, yay. But in the spirit, because I'm a pastor and I have to be spiritual, in the spirit I'm just like, but you know what? I want people to know about this Jesus because there's so much about his love and grace in this book. So let's see why it's important to have a good perspective. Read a letter for you here. This is a letter that... Uh, uh, a, a young woman wrote to her parents at, uh, during like, the first quarter of her first year, her freshman year at college, and this is what she wrote. Dear Mom and Dad, since I left for college, I have been remiss, must be an English major, remiss, okay? In re and only an English major would laugh at that, right? Okay, um... <laughs> remiss in writing, and I'm sorry for my thoughtlessness uh, in not having written before. I will bring you up to date now, but before you read on, please sit down. You're not to read any further unless you sit down. Well, then I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and the concussion I got when I jumped out the window of my dormitory when it caught fire shortly after my arrival here, it's pretty well healed now. I only spent two weeks in the hospital, and, and now I can see almost normally. And I only get those sick headaches once a day. Fortunately, the fire in the dormitory and my jump was witnessed by an attendant at the gas station near the dorm. And he was the one who called the fire department and the ambulance. He also visited me in the hospital. And since I had nowhere to live because of the burnt out dormitory, he was kind enough to invite me to share his apartment with him. It's really a basement room, but it's kind of cute. <laughs> 
He's a very fine boy, and we've fallen deeply in love, and we're planning on getting married. We haven't got the exact date yet, but it'll be before my pregnancy begins to show. <laughs> yes, mom and dad, I am pregnant, and I know how much you're looking forward to being grandparents, and I don't know that you will welcome the baby and give it the same love and devotion and tender care that you gave me when I was a child. Now, the reason for the delay in our marriage is that my boyfriend has a minor infection which prevents us from passing our premarital blood test, and I carelessly caught it from him. Well, now that I've brought you up to date, I want to tell you, there was no dormitory fire. I did not have a concussion or skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. I'm not engaged. I'm not infected. There is no boyfriend. However, I am getting a D in American history and an F in chemistry. <laughs> And I want you to see those marks in their proper perspective. <laughs> All the college students are going, give me a link. What can I, can, I, can, can, can I send that? Can I email that? Why is it important? Because in context, perspective is everything. And as we step into the book of Revelation, I, I, I need us to continue to remember that God is good. He is in charge, and that He is God, that He is divine, because the nature and character of God will affect how we view this book, how we receive what God has for us. So what I want to do here is I want to step into the Word of God here in Revelation. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, then I'm going to jump to verses 9 uh, through, um, I might just keep reading through 20, hold on, we'll see what happens, okay? But Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 kind of sets some uh, uh, foundation for us. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him, to show his bond servants, plural, the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, <laughs> excuse me, in prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, meet me at verse 9. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker, in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind, behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Verse 12, and then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me I want to stop there because, again, I'm a very visual person, right? And so what are we learning? Well, in that, those first three verses, we learned some awesome things. One, a little bit about what's being revealed. Wachter covered this last week. What's being revealed and talked about is the revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to understand something. John, the Apostle John, this is the one who wrote the Gospel of John and then John 1, 2, and 3, those, those letters. This is someone who walked with Jesus Christ, who knew him when he was incarnate on earth. Yet here he gets a revelation of Jesus that blows him away. Let's look at verse 17. When John turns around after hearing that voice like a trumpet, right? He turns around and what does he see? When I, what did he see? Oh, let me read, well, let's read that, then we'll see what he saw. <laughs> you see? Okay. Let's actually go with verse 13. Um, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw, this is Jesus, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. So that's a pretty gnarly thing to see, okay? And I love this. You know, this is going to make me sound smart. You may know me better if you're visiting. I am smart. Um, <laughs> like, that, when you ever see like or as in Scripture, it is a simile. It's describing something that's almost indescribable. You know what I'm saying? And so... This is an overwhelming picture, and he's trying to reel in and rein in for, for the original readers, as well as for us, what he saw. But we know that it's Jesus. And again, Jesus walked with Jesus. He was described himself in that humble way in his, in his, in his gospel as the one whom Jesus loved. Okay. 
Did anybody catch that one? The humble? Okay, we're moving on. Um, Yet when he turns around, he is astonished. And what happens is this. When I saw him, verse 17, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Again, I'm a visual person, right? And so as I'm, as I'm reading this, I'm just like going, whoa, okay. I get over that and I'm like, how is it to, to know that this is Jesus speaking to you, the one whom he had spent time with, who had seen crucified and risen again and ascended into heaven and whom he had spent his entire life testifying to. He's on this island of Patmos. Why? Because of the word of God and because testifying of who Jesus was. He was persecuted for standing for truth and righteousness. Amen. And all of a sudden he's there and I, I picture it. It's like this. It's like that, that voice. And John's not in trouble here, but this is how I relate it. When you were a kid, now I know Eli can relate to this, but maybe, you know, maybe other ones can't. Did you, did you ever get busted doing something that you shouldn't have been doing? Yeah, him and I are the only ones, whatever. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about? And you're just in the middle. You think you're getting away with it. And all of a sudden, you hear that voice. Whether it was your mom, dad, auntie, grandparents, but it sounded like a voice of many waters, didn't it? And you're, it was just like, you know, a waterfall. And you're just like, Ooh. And, and you're going, if I don't turn around, maybe I'm invisible. Make me invisible. You know, and it doesn't work, does it, right? <laughs> So let, me, let me switch perspective. So you know, okay. So so you're like that, right? And all of a sudden you're like that, and you're like this. Oh! <laughs> you know, I I bust my kids all the time. It's so funny. Um, but that's what I feel like what's happening. Again, John's not in trouble, but he is just amazed and in awe. And there's a little bit of fear, I think, there. And what is his reaction? He falls down at Jesus' feet as though he were. Yeah. I mean, he, he hit. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody pass out before, but when they pass out, they, they, it's not like they just go, ah. there's no swooning. They hit the ground. As we were listening to all the statistics that Waxer was bringing us through last week, of all the just kapokahiness and all the loloness. That's right, I speak pigeon. No. Um, <laughs> that was for you, Arch. Um, as we, were you overwhelmed in hearing some of that? Just all the things that are happening, you're just like, where on earth is this heading? What is going on? And it can bring an element of fear, can it? If you have the wrong perspective. But if we believe God truly is good, omnipresent, all-knowing, all-powerful, He is divine, He is God, and we have that trust in Him. We can understand that, you know what, he, he, he has our best interest in mind. Amen. So as we get overwhelmed, what, what, what do we do with that? How do we deal with that? Well, I think we understand the nature and character of God first and foremost. And, and I come to this, and I want to fall at the, his feet as though dead as well, because it's crazy out there. And because I'm usually out at Windward, and I get, I get to facilitate the messages and, and prayer out there, and... I had a little kind of Q&A with people, and I said, how did you guys feel after hearing the sermon last week? And they're going back and forth. They said, just what's, you know, what stood out to you? Like, what, did, what was on your heart and in your mind? And some people were just like, with everything that's going on, where's the church and all this? I'm like, that's a good question. They were just like, it can be overwhelming to, to see that there's so many things that are out of our control. What do we do? We feel helpless, right? Well, guess what? We are helpless, but God's not. And in Christ, neither are we. We're helpless when we do things by our own power. We are not helpless. We are empowered with the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit when we do things God's word or God's way by his word. You see what I'm saying? So let's not get overwhelmed as Waxer brings us through this book. Let's remember God is good all the time. Let's remember he is God. And let's keep that perspective. What's going to be our filter? How are we going to understand when we read these verses But if the filter for who God is is his word and we understand that this is not information, that this is something that tells us, shows us, and points us from Genesis to Revelation to Jesus Christ, his goodness, his righteousness, that he is just in all things, we can be sure that this is a firm foundation. You guys hear what I'm saying? Amen. And it's not by osmosis we're like, okay, I need to know stuff. I know people who know a lot of stuff about God, but they don't necessarily know God. 
I know a lot of people who say, yeah, the Word of God is close to my heart. It's in my heart. But they're holding on to it. What we know needs to penetrate our hearts. It needs to affect what we put our hands to. Because when we walk out of the book of Revelation, as we begin to go through this, seeing God as an amazing, awe-inspiring, loving God, wanting our love, giving us his love, us wanting to worship, that should change how we live, shouldn't it? Not just our thinking, not just our feelings, but it should change how we act. It should change how we view people. It should change how we share the love of Christ with people. Are you guys with me on that? Are you wanting to be in that place? I'm a coffee lover, okay? I was going to cut this out, but I just, I have the props, so, and no self-control, so here we go. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding, I have a little. Um, I, 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 I love coffee. Just plain and simple, I love coffee, right? What do you need for good coffee? Well, you need water. Water helps. You need, well, coffee, because it's coffee, all right? But you also need a filter. If you don't have a filter, you're picking stuff out of your teeth for a long time, aren't you? You get rot gut, right? I don't know if you guys ever had like campfire coffee or whatever. I lived in Colorado for a while and I didn't have a coffee maker. I don't know why I just didn't go buy one, but you know, whatever. I just, I didn't have one. So I learned how to do, make boiled coffee. So you, 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 you boil water. Okay. I was able to do that. Yes. Okay. My wife says I can't cook. Okay. I was boiling water and then you take the coffee and you you pour, you know, you, you pour it in there, you stir it in there, and then what you do is you remove it from the heat, but to get the coffee grounds to go down, you take a little cold water, and you put the cold water in there, and it begins to sink down to the bottom. All the college students are now taking notes, really? Oh, I'm going to try that. I'm going to buy a coffee maker. <laughs> but you still, when you pour it in, you know what you get? You still get some of them little, and you're picking stuff out of your teeth, right? Now, coffee people, though, don't be, don't be lying on this one, all right? How many people have, have needed coffee, oh, let's change that, wanted coffee, because I don't need it, I just, you know, I enjoy it, I can stop whenever I want, um, have wanted coffee, but there's no filters, right? And you're just like, okay, paper towel, that'll work. I've been so desperate for coffee, I'm just like, double ply toilet paper, let's do it, man, it's, it'll, right? Right? We're desperate to filter things, right? Because we want the good stuff. And I'm not saying God is, I mean, he's better than a cup of coffee, but I'm just saying, if we want a good cup of coffee, what's our filter? If we want to understand who God is as we get to the book of Revelation and understand his nature and character, let, let's have God's word be our filter, amen? amen? This is going to give us the right perspective despite our circumstances. This will give us the right perspective despite what's going on outside of our realm of control. Are we able to filter that? Well, it's interesting. John 17, verse 17 says this. Sanctify them in what? The truth. What is the truth? Your word, Lord, is truth. That's an amazing thing because we come to the word and it points us to Jesus. It's in Jesus that we find our sanctification, our righteousness. This is what other people have to say about the Bible. They say this, the Old Testament, as everyone who has looked into it is aware, drips with blood. There is indeed no more bloody chronicle in all the literature of the world. Well, well yeah, that's true. But again, the context of people doing what they want in sin and the consequences of that. You guys follow me? Another one says this, the Old Testament is a chronicle of horrors describing... Okay, again, view of God. An egocentric collection of supernatural beings who are always doing rotten things to gentle souls like Job. Does that person know God? Is he reading the same Bible? That's not what I see. Amen. It's important to get into God's word and to know that it's truth and understand that it points us to Jesus. How can we do this? Well, I love this. A couple of things we need to do. We're, we're moving along. You guys doing okay? Yeah. All right. Ezra 7.10. Wax referenced it last week. One of the, my favorite verses, Ezra 7.10 says this. Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach his statutes and ordinances in all of Israel. So what are we talking about there? As God is using God's word as our filter, how do we approach it? Well, first, have you set your heart to study God's word? Let me ask you a question. What did you do before you came here? Don't answer out loud. Did you set your heart to receive what God has for you before you came in here? I'm not saying this to point your fingers, okay? Or point my finger at you. Do we take it that serious, though? That we encounter God? I want us to be and get to a place, not of perfection, but obedience, where we say, I'm coming to church, not just to come to church. I'm coming because, you know what? God has something for me. And I want us to go beyond that. I want us to come to a place where we say, you know what? I want to give God everything. You know what that is? That's just you. 
Do you realize that God is pleased with you? Amen. You've given your life to Jesus Christ. You're born again. Guess what? He's pleased with you. He loves you. Just because. Just the way you are. Loves you so much he won't leave you that way. How amazing is that? When we step into that time of worship that we give God everything and when you step into that place, guess what? You can't help but receive because he loves you so much. We get filled up with Jesus so that we leave here. We're just spilling Jesus on people. What you doing? Spilling Jesus on people. That's what I like to do. What that looks like could be a kind word, could be a prayer, could be a ride. Don't know. But let's be in that place filled up with his love because of his word. And when we set our hearts to be in the right place, guess what? That's a great thing. But we don't just set our hearts there. As we come to God's word, what do we do as we go through this? We need to do it. Apply what God asks us to do. Did God challenge you on something last week? Whether it's your quiet time or at, at a sermon. If he challenged you on something, did he ask you to respond to him in some way? If he asked you to respond in some way, did you respond? It's not always easy, is it? But when we turn to see God and we fall at his feet as though dead because we realize how amazing he is, there has to be a response. I love this. Check this out. Verse 17, Revelation says what? He falls at his feet like a dead man, freaked out, and rightly so. But Jesus does what? Places his right hand on John and says what? Do not be afraid. I want to encourage us as we step into the book of Revelation, as it gets kind of, whoa, what? Don't be afraid. Because in the first few verses of this book, what does it say? Blessed is he who reads, who hears, and who heeds. That's awesome. There's a blessing. There's a blessing in reading God's word because it's powerful. It's not a magic thing or whatever, but it's an amazing thing. You guys following with me? So let's do that. Let's set our heart and let's study it. Let's apply it in our lives. Let's walk out what he's asked us, commanded us, invited us to do, and we're going to see amazing things. Okay, short story. Well, a story. Um, <laughs> we'll say short story. Um, we had the, um, what did we do on Saturday? What did we do yesterday, people? Leadership. leadership retreat. I was just testing you. I knew I was there teaching, so I know that's what it was. Um, leadership retreat yesterday. And I just gave an opportunity as we looked at what is a life group, you know, a small group. What's a life group? Well, it's something that should encourage and promote life, hence life group. Yeah, pretty catchy, huh? I didn't come up with that, but um, it should promote life. And, and I just said, you know, I want you guys to celebrate victories. I want you guys to share at your tables just one thing that the Lord has done in a small group or life group that you've been a part of. And these amazing testimonies came up. And people begin to share these places where miracles happened. One story was that the, a certain individual um, uh, had, had known uh, a friend who heard from somebody at 7-Eleven, no, who had a friend who was diagnosed HIV positive. They tested it, yep, tested it again, yep. Well, this person was a Christian. They continued to pray for this person. Did the test, came back negative. Well, that can't be right because, we, you know, tested it again, yep, it's negative, you don't have it. I'm like, what? Because this person stepped into a place of where a small group was, they thought they were there to be ministered to, and they were but they got to be a part of a greater miracle. That's awesome. Are we willing and wanting to step into something like that? I am. Let's do that. Let's, let's understand that the word changes and challenges our life. As we look at this, what's our reaction? Let's not be afraid. Let's have courage. Let's take courage in Christ that we can stand for what truth and righteousness is, understanding that persecution will come. We can't be surprised. Why? Because God is sovereign. What does that mean? It means he knew what was going to happen before it happened. How does that work out? I don't know, but he does. We'll talk about that a little bit. All right, so as we get into this, we understand the filter is our word. The word is our filter. Thank you. The word is our filter. God is good. So how do we do this? How do we understand the implications? When I say God is good and you say, do we really believe it? Is it good all the time when you're going through cancer? Is it good all the time when your life is falling apart? Is it good all the time when you've lost everything? Is it good all the time when you know people have lost everything? Does God's nature and character change based on our circumstances? So let's 
understand that by continuing to walk through that with him. God is good all the time. What are the implications? Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Our flagship verse, if you will, for God being good. As you're turning there, uh, it's awesome because in Isaiah 41.10, Jesus speaks and he says this, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous hand. It's an amazing thing because, you know, he reached down to John, placed his right hand on him and said, don't be afraid. If you're fearful right now because of a circumstance, you know what? God right now is reaching down. He's saying, don't be afraid. I'm in control even though it doesn't seem like it. How do we know that? Romans 8, 28 says what? Romans 8, 28 says this, says, hold on, I'm almost there. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, right? What does this mean though? Whose good does God work for? Ours. Well, who is that? Us in this context is those who are called according to his purpose, meaning what? Christians, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ in the circumstances you're in, he is working actively. He is actively working for good despite your circumstances. That's not an easy thing. I don't know what you're going through, but God does. I don't know what he's encouraging you with right now or challenging you with, but you know what? I want you to receive what he has for you. That makes sense. Despite our circumstances, he is encouraging us. He is bringing us out. He's actively doing that. Those who are what? Called according to his purpose. Okay, sovereignty of God. Sovereignty of God. A mystery, attention. I don't understand how it works, okay? I can, I can look at it like this. If this screen, I forgot what it was first service to, if this screen is time, God is off the screen. God is the screen. He is outside of time. He is sovereign over all things. He knows what's going to happen, but hold on a second. If he knows what's going to happen, how can there be free will? I, I don't know. Ask God. How, does that, how do we hold that intention? Well, we'll get there in a second because what I want us to look at is this. If we're saved, if we've given our lives to Jesus Christ, this verse tells us despite our circumstances, God is good because he is good. He is actively working for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Called from what? From death to life. How? Because Jesus Christ died on a cross for you and you've given your life to him. We can be confident that he's working for our good. And how many things does he work for our good? What does it say? All. In the Greek, all means? All. Oh, actually, has taught you well. <laughs> every circumstance, every situation, despite what may be happening to us, in spite of us, because of that. Now, let's look at where's John as he's writing this letter, and who's he writing it to? Well, we learned last week that he's on the island of Patmos, this barren island in the middle of nowhere where the Romans banished these criminals to. He's there alone. And he's writing to what? A church that is being persecuted, that is being killed, whose families are being separated and decimated, whose children are being killed. And he's writing what? That God is good, that God is in charge, that he is sovereign. You know, I don't know what your Patmos is, I don't know what you're going through right now, but he is good. Let's hold on to that truth. Let's understand that. He is always acting on our benefit. There is no except, there is no but. But as God looks down upon us outside of time as he is the screen, his view is always one of a loving father. His view is always one of saying, I have your best interest in mind despite what's happening because I love you, because I am good. I'm allowing this to happen because you are gonna come out on the other side knowing my love in a deeper way. You're gonna come out on the other side prepared to speak into somebody else's life. Turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. I illustrate this. How do we see this acting out? How do we see this? How do we look at this unchangeable promise of bringing good despite circumstances? How do we understand this unchangeable promise despite the fact that we are not getting some difficult questions answered to our satisfaction? Gospel of Mark chapter 5. What's happening there? Well, I'll tell you what's happening. We have in chapter 4 that 
The disciples get in a boat with Jesus and they're crossing the Sea of uh, Galilee and there's this huge, huge storm. The wind and the waves are overflowing it. They're, 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 as Jesus is asleep, I love it, on the pillow. As he's asleep there, they're like, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? And he gets up and he goes, be still. And everything stops. They go through this gnar- gnarly, life-threatening storm and they end up on the shores of uh, in the area of the Decapolis, of the Gerasenes or Gatherings, depending on your translation, right? And what meets them? A hairy, naked, cut, shackled, broken, crazy, possessed madman. Welcome to ministry. <laughs> I'm serious. This is probably one of the best illustrations of what ministry is like that I've ever seen. And that for pastors, for all of us. I believe in the priesthood of all believers, people. We're in the same boat together, all right? You're going to meet naked, hairy, crazy people. Sometimes literally, but often figuratively. I laugh at this because I was that figuratively naked, hairy, crazy person before I knew Jesus. And I know some of your stories, too. But God is good, and he's brought us out of that. And he's used us to show his goodness. But can you imagine stepping out of this amazing, gnarly storm where you thought you were dead, going, what the heck's going on? To all of a sudden this crazed demoniac coming down and running down. And what does he do? He runs down and he falls at the feet of Jesus. And he looks up and Jesus begins to have this conversation with them. If you look at the verses, it's kind of backwards and forwards. But he begins by saying, what's your name? And all of a sudden these demons manifest. And it, this legion of demons, this mountain of demons, d- d- so it comes out and begins to say, what do you have to do with us, son of the most high God? It's not the time. Do not cast us out. And it's just crazy. And what I can't believe is that, you know what? Salvation and deliverance has never been closer to this man than in this moment where he's at the foot of his Savior, Jesus. But at the foot of his Savior, what is happening? Spiritually, emotionally, physically, he is being ruined. Because God is good, because he is sovereign. He has a plan for this man's life. And he's willing to take his disciples through a storm that they think is going to kill them so he can deliver this man. Why? Because he's having an, an impact on a community that will come to know Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Well, what happens? We read the story. He's delivered. And this is what's so, this is, so, I, I, I like Jesus' style, uh, and how can you not? He's God. Jesus says yes to the demons when they said, don't cast us out to the dark pit, but put us in the pigs. Jesus says yes to the people of the area that come and say, you're freaking us out, dude. This is like weird. Please leave. He said, okay. But the man who was delivered from the demons, whose life is restored, who when we meet at the end of the story is sitting there clothed in his right mind, looks at Jesus and says, I want to go with you. And Jesus says, "Ah, no. (laughs) How does that work? Because God is sovereign, he's good, and he has a plan. Well, how do we know that? What happens? He says, what? Go back to your home and tell everyone all that the Lord has done for you, how he has had mercy on you. So what does he do? He goes and he tells everybody about what Jesus did. And can you imagine this guy used to be crazy possessed and, and crazy, now he's crazy with Jesus. We need to be crazy with Jesus, I think, a little bit more, okay? Within reason, it's easier for me because I'm spastic, but work with me, okay? Are we crazy for Jesus? Because what does he do? He goes back, and these people who are just going, they ran away because he was super, like, gnarly possessed, and now they're going, okay, Jesus freak, what's going on, okay, hold on. But they're what? No, they're amazed. Why? Because this man's life has been radically changed, and because of that, he gets the opportunity to lead a mountain, a mountain, that's not the word what I'm saying, lots of people to know who Jesus is. Because when they visit this area later on in the Gospel of Mark, people begin to bring the sick and the afflicted to him. Why? Because they remember what this guy said about who Jesus is and the deliverance that was in his life. The storm that you're going through, the Patmos, that island that you're in right now, guess what? It might not just be for you. Amen. Jesus might have some crazy naked person that you don't know about yet whose life is going to be radically changed because you're weathering this storm. And you're asking, God, do you not care that I'm perishing? Yeah, he does. You know what? He's going to still that storm in his time, okay? Let's trust him. And let's realize that it's bigger than ourselves. Did God give my wife breast cancer? Absolutely not. But you know what? I know a deeper understanding of God's love for me, for my wife and my kids than I ever, ever had. And I prayed that that wouldn't happen. God didn't answer that prayer. He wasn't silent. He said, I got something bigger and better, Aaron. Just stick with me. Just stick with me. 
And yes, he does. And he does for whatever you're going through too now. God is good all the time. He understands things that we can't. And we have to understand that we have to let God be mysterious because if he wasn't, he wouldn't be God. When I say mysterious, I don't mean just like, you know, mysterious. I mean, I don't even know if that even translates there, but whatever, that was my mysterious move, okay? <laughs> A thespian, I am not. Um, but he is, and if I can understand him, he wouldn't be God. Amen. And I'm glad that I can't articulate who he is all the time. I'm glad that there's things beyond that because he's an amazing, amazing God. And so what do I see? I see it's interesting. It's, um, <laughs> I don't know if this will make me maybe sound smart. I don't know. Um, there's this tension we hold in where this, can God do, does God know everything that's going to happen? Yes. Well, the Calvinists say, okay, say, well, you know, God's going to do what he wants to do. If he's going to call us, he's going to call us. We've been predestined. So he foreknew that. So we're going to get saved. We're going to get saved. We're going to do what he wants to do. Okay, we just got to do that. We're going to do what God says. Okay, great. Okay. Now, <laughs> on the other side, of that is Arminius. And uh, to be fair, they'll have the same voice. Arminius basically say, well, yeah, well, God may know everything, but we've got to do anything because he's called us the Great Commission, so we need to do things. If we don't do things, something's going to happen. If nothing's going to happen, people are going to go to hell. We don't want people to go to hell, we want people to get saved. Okay, so we got to do stuff. Okay, so we got to go, 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 go. God's going to do everything, so it doesn't matter. No, God has asked us to do everything, so let's do something. All right? I don't want to be a Calvinist, I don't want to be an Arminius. There's a term that I recently learned. I want to be a Calminius, okay? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Where God is sovereign and doing what he wants and I can understand it, yeah, you're God. Where God says, go and make disciples and lay hands on people and pray for the raising of the dead. Pray for people to get healed. Preach my word and see lives transformed. I'm just like, yeah! I will hold that intention because I can't put God in a box. I will be a Calminius and I invite you to be Calminius with me, okay? Because we want God to remain who God is and work with him as he calls us to do things. Am I making sense? Yeah. All right, you guys are doing awesome. All right, moving on here. God is good. Revelation 3.14 says that he is the faithful and true witness. Revelation 4.8, these are all ahead, says that he is holy and holy and holy. He is the Lord God Almighty. Revelation 6.10 calls him holy and true. He is, he's holy and true. There you go. Um, Revelation 7, 12 says that, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. As we look at God's goodness, as we see that he is sovereign, our next point is the omnis of God, the alls of the almighty. So, omnis of God, he is almighty, he is all-knowing, he is all-powerful. Well, how does this play out? Well, let's look at this. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says this, Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Because you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and they were created. That shows that he is all-powerful, but also, what? All-knowing. We are existing because of his will. And I love it because David even says, and he shows us that, you know, before we were born, he knew us. And God don't make no junk. I think somebody needs to receive that right now for whatever you're going through. Are you willing to receive that, that you're not junk? God knows what you're going through. He's working on you in this. He knows, he understands, even if you don't. If God was not all-knowing, we couldn't put the big G in his name. It'd be little G-O-D. That puts the big G in God, the big L, not loser, Lord, the big L, that he's Lord of our life. He understands. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Why is that comforting? Because when we look in the book of the Revelation and we see things that are going down or are going to go down, we're just like, whoa. How can you let this happen? Because it is within the realm of God. It is part of his plan. And it is his church. Our call in this time is to tell people that he is good, that he is loving, and that everything goes crazy he is our constant in the midst of that storm. Amen. Why is that important? Because as we go through this book, you're going to be challenged on different things. You're going to be encouraged on different things. And when you step out of here, 
and you say to somebody, hey, what are you guys doing in church? We're studying the book of Revelation. They go, oh, really? Okay, hey, well, I'm just going to be over here, okay? Never take Revelation, never talk politics, right? I mean, that's, what, I mean, that's kind of the general rule among Christians, right? Unless you want to fight. But you can say, you know what? No, I'm loving that we're in this book. Why? Because it shows the amazingness of God and his love. You're going to pique people's interest in there. So take good notes when Waxer preaches so you can actually begin to expound on how amazing God is. He is all-powerful. Why is that important? Well, it's important because is he's going to accomplish his will. If we are going to trust in him, that means we cannot do things by what? By our power, by our will, by our way. But we need to trust in God. If we've surrendered all to God, we can trust in where God is. We can trust in where God is taking us. Psalm 139 Verse 7 through 12 says this, God is not just all-knowing, he's not just all-powerful, but he is omnipresent. What does that mean? Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? So I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. I want to cap that with Jeremiah 23, 24 overhead. It says, what can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? <laughs> do I not fill the heavens and the earth? God is everywhere and I want that to be a comfort to you. I remember being a small child being six, seven years old. And I remember thinking, never, not going to church, not having understanding who God is, but just beginning to thinking and saying, what if, I, what if I wasn't born where I was born? What if I was born in a different country? What would my life be like? I mean, you think, wait a minute, what, what if I didn't exist at all? Yeah, I'm serious, six or seven years old, Okay. I mean, think, well, wait a minute. What if the world didn't exist at all? What if the universe didn't exist at all? And I get freaked out and stop thinking about that because I'm just like, that's, is there a purpose to life? And what I've learned in my walk with the Lord is this, is that he has a plan and a purpose, that he is everywhere, and that's a good thing. The things we hide from him in our heart, he's there, he knows, he wants you to release it. The good things that you do, guess what, he sees that and he says, thank you. The dark places that he's called you to walk in to bring light, he's there with you, he goes before you, he's your rear guard. When things get crazy, understand, the constant is always God. Is that making sense? Final point is this, God is not just good, he is not just omni, the alls of God, omnipowerful, omnipresent, all-knowing, omniscient, but he is God. He is divine. He's God and we're not. As Waxer said, let's deal with it. Revelation 4.10 says this, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne. They will worship him who lives forever and ever and will ca cast their crowns before the throne. See, he is God. I love the proverb that says, cease striving and know that I am God. Stop trying to do things on your own power. Understand what God's call for us is. Understand this tension and mystery that he has for us. How can we understand that he is divine and why does that make a difference? Well, let me read you this. A.W. Tozer says this, when we have a right understanding of who God is. Sorry, I lost my note there. Where'd you go? Ah, here we go. When we understand our standing before God, and this is for the Christian, when you understand, it says this, the Christian person has stopped being fooled about ourselves. We've accepted God's estimate of our own life. God knows that we're weak and helpless as he has declared us to be. But that paradox, that tension that is held is this. We know that at the same time that we are weak and helpless, we are, in the sight of God, of more importance than angels. In ourselves, nothing. In Christ, everything. Let that be our motto. Let us, in humility, continually give our lives to Jesus Christ. 
because he is God. And he does have an amazing plan for your life. If you're a Christian, you're experiencing it now. It may not have been what you thought it was going to be, but continue moving on. If you're not a Christian, he wants you to step into that place to know him, experience his love. And I'm telling you, the gravy on the Locomoco is that you will have the most amazing life far more than you could ever have imagined. I was sharing at the leadership retreat yesterday. I said, man, I just kind of four things, four steps, I just kind of realized my, how God brought me to them. Started in a bar, went to a coffee house, to a church and a high school, to a Bible study. He met me where I was at, just as he met John where John was at on the exiled island. He called me out of darkness into light as he's called many of you out of darkness into light and met you where you're at. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you haven't given your life to him, I'm gonna give you the opportunity now because he has brought you here and he wants you to know him. He wants your life because he created you and he has amazing love for you to experience he has amazing things for you to walk in. He has a purpose and call in your life.